for the purpose of trying to get a 360 degree picture of what is it that actually happened? What is it that caused us now to be in a situation in which Leon Panetta, the Secretary of Defense, said a couple of weeks ago that he puts the risk of war by the end of this month to be at 50-50? Because this is not the way things started off. So how did we get here? Only 12 and a half minutes into the president's presidency in his inaugural address, he reaches out to the Iranians, offering America's hand of friendship in return for the Iranians to unclench their fists. This was a bold move, but it wasn't a move necessarily motivated by desire as much as it was motivated by a sense of necessity, whereas some would accuse the Bush administration of having pursued wars of option Obama may perhaps be accused of having tried to pursue a peace of necessity because of the difficulties that existed in the region. In fact, understanding the background on how Obama came into power is quite important. The Bush administration had pursued an ideological foreign policy, one in which its tenants, one of its tenants read that talking to your enemies, pursuing diplomacy with them will strengthen them. In fact, you may end up legitimizing them. And as a result, the United States should only talk to the countries that deserved America's company. Now, one can have whatever views one wants about that ideology, but its track record in the case of Iran, I think, is quite clear. When the, Obama, when the Bush administration took power, Iran was squeezed between a hostile regime to its east in the Taliban in Afghanistan and to a hostile regime to its west, the Saddam Hussein government in Iraq. By the time Bush left office, Iran had become the political kingmaker of the order in those two states. He had probably left less than 50 centrifuges in 2000. By the time Bush left office, Iran had more than 8,000 centrifuges and were starting to stockpile low and rich uranium. It had spread its influence throughout the region and increased its soft power, primarily by taking advantage of America's uh, increased unpopularity in the region during the Bush administration. Against this backdrop, Obama comes in and did what no one else had done before him. He presents a foreign policy platform during the elections in which he says that he's going to reinstitute diplomacy as one of the main tools of American statecraft. And diplomacy with Iran became very much the poster child of this new approach. What under normal circumstances, would have been political suicide, became a winning card in 2008 precisely because of the American public's general rejection of the Bush foreign policy and its underlying philosophy. But time was short. The administration knew from the very beginning that this opening in the political landscape in Washington that had enabled Obama to pursue diplomacy would not last forever. Several different factors would cause it to close down, and the administration's own estimation was that it would only be open for about 12 months. On the one hand, the Iranians were stockpiling low and rich uranium. If they managed to get to about 1,200 kilos, that would be sufficient to build a bomb. At that point, pressure for taking other types of actions would likely have increased. On the other hand, you had pressure from Israel, from Saudi Arabia, states who were quite concerned about what diplomacy would mean for them. You also, of course, had some skepticism in European states. France, in particular, was afraid that Obama would be so eager to strike a nuclear deal that he would compromise on some of the West's long-standing red lines. And then, of course, you had the threat of a potential military action by the Israelis, something that the US military was against back then and remains very much against today. Of all of America's close friends, Many wished Obama well. Very few wished him success. It's very easy to just be tactical when you're not forced to make a strategic decision. Moreover, many of the red lines, we talked about some of them earlier on, that have been, committed, uh, that have been adopted, and we're assuming that these are red lines that are untouchable. These red lines have been adopted based on assumptions about the other side that the both sides make, that have been created or um, assumed in the context of no constructive engagement and interaction between the two sides. What diplomacy actually can do 
beyond figuring out a way to make the red lines compatible, is to force the two sides to reassess their assumptions about the other, about their intentions, about what it is that they're trying to do. Because these assumptions have been based primarily on paranoia. And if those assumptions are reassessed, and if it turns out that perhaps some of them are wrong and they need to be loosened, then that can then also affect the red lines that have been adopted. And that may actually, in and of itself, open up this issue in a way that is difficult to imagine before the talks take place. That's part of the reason why a critical component for a successful negotiation is the building of some level of trust. And trust is not built in the absence of communication. It's built when you have communication over a longer period of time. And you can test each other. You can verify whether your assumptions are correct or wrong. That's, I think, what ultimately is going to be needed, but it's going to require a tremendous amount of political will and stamina from both sides. We won't be able to fully trust, but it's very interesting to see that right now there's a couple of issues that both the Israeli, the American, and the European intelligence converge on, and they all agree on. One, the Iranians currently do not have a nuclear weapon. That is the assessment of all three. Two, the Iranians have not made a decision, at least not yet, and hopefully that decision can be prevented, a decision to weaponize. They all agree on that. Three, they also agree that there isn't currently an active weapons program. Those are the three common points between the various intelligences. Then you have the divergence. The divergence is if they were to make a decision, how quickly would they be able to build a bomb? How well would they be able to cheat and make sure that the, the inspectors would not find out? And if you were to take military action, how much would that be able to set back the program? That's where you have a significant divergence, particularly between the Israeli and the American assessments. The US currently, and this is very important because you won't hear this in the news, but the US currently believes very strongly that the Iranians do not have a dash out capability. That means that the Iranians would try to quickly build a bomb without getting caught. According to the US, this would take minimum six to 12 months. But because of the current level of inspections, which incidentally is not sufficient, but nevertheless, the current level of inspections that we do have, the Iranians would get caught within 30 to 60 days because they wouldn't be able to reconfigure the, the centrifuge, et cetera, without getting caught. That means that we're in a relatively comfortable position in which they can't cheat without getting caught and we can manage and we can monitor. The Israelis are not as convinced. They believe that it's closer to four to six months. And they believe that if they were to take military action, they could be able to do sufficient damage to push back the program between two to three years. The US does not dis disagree. They probably think they could push back only three years. But then the question is, what happens next? And here, the US is pointing out, well, what the Iranians likely will do is that they will use Article 10 in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is to walk out of the treaty. That means kicking out the inspections. That means that suddenly we would go from a situation in which we have insight to the program and we can take action in a timely manner to go to a situation in which we're in a complete blackout. We don't know what is taking place. And under those circumstances, it would be a much more dangerous situation, particularly since the Iranians would kick out the inspectors, they would rebuild the program deeper underground, and we would have no idea what is happening. And most likely, and this is something that the Israelis as well agree on, the decision to build the bomb would be made. Now, then the Israeli argument is, well, if that happens, Israel can always bomb again every two to three years. <laughs> it's called the mowing the lawn strategy. No, I'm not kidding you. I'm not making this stuff up. The White House believes that to be crazy. And this is, again, there's a significant divergence right now between how the Israelis believe this should be handled and how the US believes it should be handled. Both sides are taking far greater risks to maintain the status quo or to even accept risk for escalation than they're willing to take a risk for peacemaking. For some reason, 
a risk for peacemaking is considered to be so much more dangerous than a risk for escalation or for the continuation of the status quo.